Welcome to Lesson 2.1 Review, and Lesson 2.1 was about genetic testing and screening. So a little word about the difference between genetic testing and genetic screening. Genetic screening or screening in general is basically some pretty simple test just to look to see if you have increased risk factors for something to go wrong in a pregnancy. So this could be simply a... Uh, you know, you took some blood drawn, you're looking for elevated protein or other hormone levels that may give you kind of an increased risk for something to happen. Uh, maybe there's a family history, et cetera, et cetera. The genetic testing is looking exactly at maybe the genetic or the chemical reasons why something has happened. So you'd be looking for the, at the genes of the individual to see if they actually have the genetic disorder. So that's a little bit about the difference between them. They typically go hand in hand. The screen would give you a reason to go into the more involved genetic testing. All right. Now, when we're talking about genetic testing, we're really looking at mutations within a gene or a chromosome. So let's talk about mutations first. The first type of mutation we want to talk about is a single gene mutation. Now, single gene mutations come in three different flavors. Number one, autosomal dominant, like we saw in Huntington's disease. And in autosomal dominant disease, you'll only need to have one allele to have it. So if you look up here in this Punnett square, <clears throat> excuse me, with the R's, any individual who has a big R is going to have the disease. Uh, to be non-affected, you're going to have to have the two little R's. So in this case, we had two individuals who had the disease. They passed it on to what you would expect 75% of their children. And an autosomal recessive, and remember an autosome means a non-sex chromosome, so this would be one of the first 22 chromosomes. Um, this would be, you'd have to have two copies of the bad allele in order for you to have it. So let's look back up here at the, uh, the Punnett square with the R's. If you have the two little R's in this case, then you would actually have the genetic disease. So all the individuals who have a big R do not have the disease. However, the heterozygous individuals are what we would call a carrier. They carry the trait and they can pass it on to the next generation, but they're not affected by the disease. Sex-linked traits are usually only carried on the X chromosome. So for the most part, if you say X-linked and sex-linked, you mean the exact same thing. So down here, we have an example of hemophilia. That's what the H's stand for. So what we have here is a hemophiliac male who is mating with a carrier female. And you'll notice the only offspring who have the disease is the one in the lower right-hand corner. And that is the male who has the X upper script uh, small h. Okay. Now the female in the lower half, in other words, half of the females would be carriers. In other words, they would be heterozygous. Now let me show you the power of a single point mutation, or in other words, the changing of one base in the genome. Look over here in this picture in the lower right-hand corner. Here we're dealing with the hemoglobin gene. And you look here on the column on the left, you see that this one codon is CTT, -T, and this uh, codes for uh, glucine, which is a uh, amino acid. Okay. Now over here on the right, we have the middle base has been changed from a T to an A, and now you're making valine, or I'm sorry, valine, which is a different amino acid, this will change the shape of the protein and give it a new function. And in this case, that gave you the sickle cell hemoglobin and you would have sickle cell disease. Another type of mutation that you'll find out there is a multifactorial. This is a situation where not only is there a genetic component, but there's also an environmental component. And so you see here in this uh, Venn diagram, you've got the genetic factors. They will interact with environmental factors, diet, uh, environmental toxins, pollution, etc. And the combination of those two could cause you to be affected by this disease. And this is how a lot of cancers work. You may be predisposed to the cancer, but it requires an environment, environmental factor to trigger it to happen. Okay. Chromosomal mutations are going to affect parts of a chromosome or an entire chromosome. In other words, you're missing the chromosome or you have an extra one. Uh, Down syndrome, as you see over here on this karyotype to the right, this is an individual where you have an extra chromosome 21. And in this karyotype here, since they have an X and a Y chromosome, you would notate this as 47 XY plus 21, in other words, a male with Down syndrome. 
mitochondrial uh, diseases, these mitochondria have their own DNA, and there can be a mutation within this DNA that can lead to a, um, a genetic defect, and you're going to inherit these from your mother because it's the egg cell that contributes the mitochondria to the zygote. So if you look down here in this factor, really, or in this uh, picture down here in the lower left, is it really depends on how many of these defective mitochondria were given to the, to the zygote. And so in this top picture, approximately 80% of the mitochondria were damaged. So this individual would have probably a severe case of this genetic disorder. In the bottom one, only a couple of the uh, mitochondria were damaged. So in this case, the person may not show any symptoms or not even have the disease. And then the person in the middle mm, could have a mild form of disease because half the mitochondria are good, half of them are damaged. Okay. How can we detect uh, these genetic mutations? Well, the first thing we're going to do would be carrier screening. And this would be looking at a, a family history. So you could be looking at pedigrees, or you could do other genetic tests to find out which of the parents is a carrier. And if it's both, in the case of a uh, recessive disorder, that would create a greater chance for the kid to have the disease. Okay. Pre-implantation diagnosis, this would be done during in vitro fertilization. Remember, in vitro fertilization is when you are doing uh, fertilization, say, in a Petri dish. And before you implant the embryos, you want to check them to see if they have any genetic diseases. You'll discard the ones with the genetic diseases, and you'll implant the ones that have the best uh, genetic possibilities. Fetal screening, this is when uh, the little baby's still in the womb and prior to it being born. And you have maybe, uh, maybe you have a reason to check to see if it's at certain risk for certain things. Uh, first and most common one is going to be the ultrasound, but maybe the ultrasound gives you a little indication that we may need to get some more information. So then you could go to amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling, where you can look at the actual chromosomes of the baby. And we're going to visit that idea here in a little bit later. Newborn screening. As soon as the newborn is, is born, obviously hence the word newborn, you could run very test on it. Uh, you're going to be able to collect blood samples. From there, you could be able to do uh, genetic testing on that. So um, some of these are can be visual, but some of them can be a little bit more involved on that one. So that just gives you a, a kind of a look at some of the basic uh, screenings and tests that we can do. All right. The other thing we talked uh, a little bit extensively about is what is the, uh, the roles of a genetic counselor. Personally, I think being a genetic counselor would be kind of a neat job. Not only is there some really cool science in it, you're dealing with genetics, you're dealing with some screening, etc., but you also have the chance to truly help a family. Because if, if they are carriers for a disease, they really want to know what's the chance of them passing it on to the next generation. And you're going to be able to guide them through that process and really help a family. It would be a very rewarding career, uh, if you want my opinion. All right. When we talked about our screening and we were looking at... Um, Basically, we were screening individuals to see if they had a genetic disease or not. We did PCR so that we could amplify their DNA so that we had a lot of it to test. And so what is PCR? PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and it has three major steps. The first step is denaturation. This is where you're going to heat it up into the room, oh, say the mid-90s uh, Celsius, so you're pretty near the boiling point, point. And this is going to cause the DNA to unzip. Now, once the DNA is unzipped, you want to cool it down a little bit. Not all the way so it zips back up, but just cool it down just a little bit. And this is the process called annealing. During this cool down step, it does not zip back up, but it's cool enough for the primers to attach to the DNA. These primers are going to tell you where the DNA polymerase is going to attach and start to make the complementary strands. We're going to use a DNA called or DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase. It comes from a TAC polymerase comes from a bacteria that lives in hot springs, so it's very stable at high temperatures. So we're going to be able to heat this DNA back up to around 70 degrees Celsius, and we're going to do the step called extension. During this step, TAC polymerase is going to make your complementary pair or complementary strand of DNA, and you've doubled your copies of DNA. So if you look down here, when you do PCR, as you go through cycle and cycle and cycle, you're basically doing exponential growth. And so you can see here, after the first cycle, you've doubled the amount of DNA that you had before. And as you go on through each cycle, you're doubling, doubling, and doubling again. So we had this one experiment where we went through 30 cycles, and there, out of one piece of DNA, you made 2 billion copies of it. So 
within a short you know, couple of hours, you can have billions and, billions and billions of copies of DNA. You just have more material to work with. So what's the relationship between genotype and phenotype? And if you can remember from your Bio 1 class, the genotype, in other words, the type of genes that you have, they determine your phenotype or the physical expression of the genotype, or in plain English, what are you going to look like? So we modeled genetic testing when we looked at our ability to test, or excuse me, to taste PTC. And so if you were an individual who could not taste PTC, we were going to model that as you had the recessive disorder. All right? So if you were homozygous dominant, you were a very strong taster. You tasted this stuff right away and it was ugh, yuck. Okay. If you were heterozygous, in this case, you were the model of our carriers, you maybe you tasted it a little bit or it took you a while to taste it, but you weren't anywhere near like that strong taster was, where it was gross right away. And then if you were homozygous recessive, in order, in other words, you're the individual who uh, who has our model of the uh, recessive disorder, you couldn't taste it at all, all right? Couldn't taste it, it just tasted like paper. You couldn't even taste the PTC on you. All right. So what caused you to be a non-taster? Well, basically you had a SNP, in other words, a single nucleotide polymorphism. In plain English, what that means is one base in that gene was different than the tasters, and that gave that protein a new shape, therefore a new function, and your function was you could not taste that chemical. So here's what it looked like um, when you did the, uh, the gel electrophoresis. Okay, If you look over here on the right, the taster has a GCC, let me write that, GGCC um, four base pair area. And that happens to be the place where HAY3, a particular restriction enzyme, will cut. Right? The non-taster had the polymorphism. Instead of being GGCC, it was GGGC. It had that G in the wrong place. That made it possible for HAY3 not to cut at that place. And if you look down here at the bottom in the gel, that if you were a taster, you would have two bands because the restriction enzyme cut in one place. Cut once, get two pieces. And over here on the left is the non-taster. They just wasn't cut at all, so their fragment was bigger. They have a single band, and it didn't travel as far as the other one. Right? So we were able to use... Um, a SNP and restriction enzyme to get a genetic marker. What med medical interventions or lifestyle changes could you have that if you're a pregnant female, what could you do to give your baby a better chance to be born healthy? Well, number one is go through all the screenings. Take the ultrasound. They're pretty inexpensive. They give you a great picture of, you, of the fetus um, developing inside you. And especially with the, the new 3D uh, ultrasounds, you get a great picture. You can almost kind of see the kid, what they're going to look like before they're born. Now, if the ultrasound gives you uh, some indications that you're at higher risk for some, let's say, Down syndrome or something like that, then you can do the amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling. But you'd only want to do those if you have to. You're going to be dealing with an obstetrician. That's your baby doctor. Set up appointments. Go to them. Pay attention to what he or she says. Now, in general, the healthier you are when you're pregnant, the better it's going to be. So regular exercise, even when you're pregnant. Some women run marathons when they're deep into their pregnancy. You may not want to do that. But, you know, hey, get out and walk. Go to the gym. Do all that good stuff. Take your prenatal vitamins. Folic acid is a very important vitamin to have. It's going to help prevent uh, neural tube defects and especially spina bifida. All right, so make sure you're taking your folic acid. Part of a healthy lifestyle is eating the proper nutrients. Stay away from... Uh, Tuna, which could have a lot of mercury in it. Uh, certain lunch meats can have too much nitric uh, compounds in them. And basically, eat well because you're really eating for two. Certain medications that are over the counter, you shouldn't take. Uh, make sure you're taking the right ones. You can call your obstetrician for more detail on those. Limit stress. Baby can feel the stress. So get rid of your stressors. Make sure you're planning ahead. Make sure you got your finances in order. Make sure that if you're going to use daycare, if you're going to go back to work, make sure you have that set up ahead of time. Make sure that your pediatrician is helping you with information because when the finally the day comes, you're going to need that information to be ready for. And then also, obviously, stay away from drugs, caffeine and alcohol. They will cross through the placenta and they will really impede the development of the newborn. 
The last thing you learned in this lesson was about amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling. Uh, these are two tests that you really want to do only if you have to. In other words, the ultrasound or some other blood work or whatever has given you an indication that you need to have these two. Now, the difference between chorionic villus sampling and um, amniocentesis really isn't that big. They're both trying to do the same thing. They're trying to get cells from the fetus so that you can do a karyotype or other genetic testing. Now, in chorionic villus sampling, you can actually do earlier you're going to get more cells from the baby. However, there is a slighter, slightly higher risk for a miscarriage on that one. Amniocentesis is done later. There's less risk of a uh, miscarriage, but you're not going to get as many cells because you're just getting the cells from the amniotic fluid. All right? So you see down here in chorionic villus sampling, you're going to get cells from the placenta. And then down here with amniocentesis, you're going to get cells that have fallen off the fetus and they're floating around inside the amniotic fluid. Okay, that's going to wrap up this. So make sure you do a good job studying and good luck on tomorrow's test. So we're going to catch you next time.